Lucy Gibson, I'm with Du Bois and King. I'm a transportation planner and traffic engineer. And we have been working with Josh and others, a group, some of whom are here tonight, of uh, TAC members to update the Addison County's Regional Transportation Plan, which is actually a chapter within the regional plan. And we are holding three public meetings tonight, here, Thursday night in Moncton, and next Monday night in Shoreham to get input from the communities and anyone who wants to come on priorities, observations, issues we need to be aware of, that kind of thing. So it's a very open discussion that we'll have. Do you have anything you want to mention, uh, Josh, no, before funny. I kind of get into it? For the couple of you in here that don't know me, uh, I'm Josh Donaghy, I'm the transportation planner here at ACRPC. And I just wanted to thank you all for coming out and volunteering time to be a part of this process. So, look forward to hopefully an uh, interesting and productive meeting here. Great. Well, it's nice to have a small group. Everyone's going to get a chance to <laughs> tell us what's on your mind. So here's a quick snapshot of what we'll talk about tonight. I'm going to talk with the, show some slides of information for probably 20 minutes or so, and then we'll get into some discussion points on uh, what are the your observations on trends, things to consider, and what are the hot spots and whatnot. But for now, I'll go through a little presentation, a quick snapshot on what's the regional plan, what's the transportation plan, um, what projects are currently in the works in Addison County from the Agency of Transportation, which is not the only transportation projects getting done, but the ones we know about, and then get into some of the data and observations we've been making on the region and doing our research and then also looking ahead at what some of the trends that we expect in the future that need to be aware of as you're setting your next transportation plan. So the regional plan, probably many of you are familiar with it if you're already involved with ACRPC uh, work, but just to, for those who aren't, um, and this is just a quote from the plan, but it kind of sums it up nicely. The regional plan charts a course for the region through the year 2021, and the ACRPC will work to implement the plans, goals, and programs and policies. And so it's really the guide for the Regional Planning Commission, which in turn works for the member communities and, and also somewhat of a go-between between communities and state agencies. And some of the ways the plan is used, it provides information for citizens in their grant applications and infrastructure projects and conservation efforts and other initiatives done by towns that are affected by land use and growth and transportation. It does have regulatory standing for Act 250 hearings and it also provides some way to prioritize planning initiatives in the region. So, And then the transportation plan in some regions they have a standalone plan in Addison County it's a chapter within the regional plan and it really analyzes and prioritizes transportation needs of the region and it the primary overarching goal of the transportation plan as it stands currently is to preserve and improve the region's transportation network so really looking at how do we do that what are the things we need to do and it provides guidance to the ACRPC TAC who are at times asked by VTRANS to prioritize transportation projects to get a, you know, give them some input on what are the priorities and what projects should move ahead before others. I don't know if the agency always listens to the TAC, but <laughs> there's some conversation. So I went through the state's capital plan and their website and just pulled out a probably not every single project, I kind of combined some and lumped some together, but of this is kind of the projects that are currently in the works in the state agencies. And again, there's a lot of local projects as well that are you know, not reflected, but there are a whole number of projects that are intended to improve the railroad line through the area that I think in varying degrees of construction and completion or some still design. And there are a lot of them intended to bring up the railroad up to standards for hopefully Amtrak service coming along. And I don't know too much more about the funding or the status of that, but that's definitely something that's been at play for a while and on the minds of folks. 
And then there's a couple rail bridges in Middlebury that would be um, a road over rail that will be worked on to allow higher trains to get through town. That's another significant project. And then the Omia Rail Spur, I think, is listed. And I don't know anything about the status, but I think it's um, kind of on the fringe of the region. And anyway, these so are just things that are in the V-Trans capital? Well, it's on V-Transparency. Some of these are just candidate projects, so they're not really in the plan yet. And some are projects that are underway. And I actually brought the list if anyone wants more information. I am just going to interject this at this time. Uh, I have gone to consistently to their open house, and I did ask that question. I don't know whether it was to the geologist there at the time or not. So what's the status of the rail spur? He said it's pretty much a done deal, simply because the problem was the uh, elevation for unloading their trucks into the rail into the rail cars. That it would it had involved so much structure there to do that that it would just be more money than they wanted to spend. Now that's an unofficial comment that I got from somebody there, for whatever that's worth. And that may well be true, you know. Yeah. And maybe they should take it off their list if they're not really working on it. So, you know, and maybe that's kind of, I mean, that's one thing the plan can, you know, ask for clarification and sort of honesty <laughs> and what's going or what's not. So, and I don't know enough about the process for knowing when do they officially wipe things off lists. But I kind of suspected something like that, having heard a bit about it in the past. Um, so next on this list, which I kind of group by type of project, there's a couple intersections, Exchange Street and Middlebury, and Route 7 with Little Chicago Road and Ferrisburg, um, which I think those are both looking at roundabouts or signals. And that's, a, that's a signal that's going in. Oh, OK. So that's one that's going down. That's good. Yep. And then something on Route 17 and East Street in New Haven. So. And these are again all different stages. So that's a intersection realignment, right? Thing and then there's a number of resurfacing projects on state highways that are things that sort of churn their way through and get done. And then the state tends to develop those based on pavement ratings and that kind of thing. And then there's a number of, and then a project in Ripton on Route 125, I think further working on issues related to flooding and erosion. Um, several bridges, <laughs> Bristol, Ripton, and Starksboro. And then a number of sidewalk projects, and I think they're all in Middlebury or Virgins, and then the Middlebury Airport runway extension. So that's kind of the list that I found on the state. And again, there may be more. And if, you know, we'll make sure we have a complete list in the plan just to be aware of what's in the works. Um, so what I want to talk about now are some of the data. We've been looking at the traffic and safety and other kinds of data. I'll give a quick summary of what we found so far and certainly chime in with your reaction or questions as we go through. So we're a small group. Uh, the first um, thing I wanted to just show was the functional classification map of the region. So this is a map where the different types of highways are kind of color-coded here. So Route 7 is red, that's a principal arterial. The yellow are minor arterials, and the blue are major collectors. And as far as a regional transportation plan goes, and, and then there's you know railroad and other things, but these are really the roads that the region probably has a little more influence or more role in doing the planning, because these are the major roads that go from town to town. The regional plan doesn't really cover every local road or local issue. On the other hand, if there are perennial types of problems with local roads, maybe a policy change or something like that needs to be addressed, that, that's certainly within the purview of a regional plan. But that was really what I wanted to, you know, as we're thinking about the road network, which is the biggest part of the transportation system, it's really the more major roads are the, and their intersections with minor roads are the ones that we would be looking at most closely. And here's a map just showing average daily traffic on the road network. 
by category. And so you can see in Middlebury, it's dark red. Sorry, the color. Should we turn down? Can we turn down this lights or? We can. I mean, it's not that, that elaborate, but it might, it might help people see a little bit. There we go. So Route 7 right through Middlebury is where a lot of local traffic converges with sort of through traffic on Route 7. And then also Route 7 north of Virgins, where it kind of gets the 22A and Route 7 corridor come together, are by far the highest traffic volumes. And then you can see that, you know, even the rest of 22A, not a whole lot of, not a very high volume in number, um, and many of the other roads as well. So we've looked at commuting data, and by far the most common, not surprisingly, way of commuting is driving alone. There is a fair amount of carpooling. Um, walking to work is uh, most common in Middlebury and Virgins, and not so much in other communities. A little bit of public transit, and a you know, fair number of people work at home. Um, a lot of people leave the region for work. The orange slice of the pie are, represent the share of people that leave the county for work. And then the gray slice of the pie actually leave the state. So you probably, you know, people that are going over to New York State, presumably, and then the rest work inside the county. And just for interest, I listed the towns with the highest auto commute, which Salisbury is in the lead there, and obviously the smaller, more rural communities. Uh, the highest bicycle commute is in the middle of the top with Middlebury at the top, but all of them fairly small levels, and I think they're all zero below the Bristol. And the highest walk commute, Middlebury again leads that with, not surprisingly, being a college town in Virginia is pretty high as well. And then actually I was New Haven, Whiting, and Addison, those are kind of high walk shares for really small towns, which is kind of interesting. So they may just be places where there's more industry in town or um, that people can find. And then carpooling, the top towns get up to almost 17% in Shora. Um, transit commute, are, it's a pretty low share, but Virgins is the highest in the region. And then working from home gets up to 19% in Goshen, which being kind of up in the mountains and probably a place people don't want to have to drive <laughs> to and from, and again, with smaller towns. So what I'm going to show now are a number of charts showing traffic volumes over a fairly long period of time. The year on the very far left is 1975 up to 2015. So that's 45 years of, or sorry, 40 years of traffic data. And this is as long as the agency's been collecting it. And these are, and this chart's all different locations on Route 7. So one of the things you can get an idea of the stations at the highest, um, the highest traffic are in Middlebury and then up in Ferrisburg, again, where it is entering Chittenden County. And then there's, you know, I won't go into all the details, but one of the interesting trends in this is things have really flattened out in the last 15, 20 years almost, as far as volume. They're not seeing a whole lot of growth on Route 7. And obviously some stations are going up and down, and that could be a bad count, or maybe it could be at the beginning of a trend, it's hard to know. But in general, it's been not a period of a lot of growth along the Route 7 corridor. And then this is, sorry, go ahead. Can you go back to the sure. slide, sorry. What, what was the um, second line down that's really jumped up in the last uh, four Yeah, years? that is Ferrisburg, Route 7, Route 7 south of Moncton Road in Ferrisburg. I know it's a little hard to tell the colors, but I, okay. yeah. Thanks. So yeah, I don't know what that's about. Um, it could be, you know, sometimes you see that if there's construction somewhere else and all of a sudden everybody's going a different route, it might be something showing up like that or big development or land use change or it's hard to know. So we want to probably see if it continues over time. But. And then if you look at the Route 22A corridor, uh, it's really showing more of an upward trend. So if you did like a mathematical regression, you'd actually get more of a significant pattern of growth, which is kind of interesting to me given their parallel routes and you know, why are they having different patterns. It's definitely lower volumes overall, but, but growing. And any thoughts or observations on why would be <laughs> welcome to chime in. But 
That includes truck traffic as well. That includes trucks, and I'm going to get more into truck traffic as well. And that, that might be, yeah, definitely one of the things that might be causing that. And then I've got a few other corridors I won't spend a whole lot of time. This is Route 17, which, you know, in the last few years has probably flattened out, again, average overall, but, you know, bouncing around a bit. And again, lower volumes than the other corridors. Here's Route 125. So the top line is in Middlebury, that's gray, and then the blue one is also in Middlebury, and then the other stations have much lower volume. It really drops off as you get away from Middlebury. And again, not much pattern of too much growth, pretty low growing. And then Route 30, also Middlebury has the highest volume, and then the other stations are pretty sleepy, not a whole lot of growth. And then Route 116, a little more of a pattern of growth again. And, um, and this is on either side of Bristol and going into Starksboro, where there's been definitely some thought that people are maybe diverting commutes to and around this area. So another thing we're going to look at pretty closely in the plan, and particularly for thinking about priorities, is safety and using crash data that's available from VTrans is a great place to start, although we do want to hear anecdotes or concerns that might not be reflected in the crash data. So what this map is showing, the splotches that you see that are from green going all the way into sort of gray right in Middlebury and darker red are places where crashes are more frequent and clustered. And then there's another layer on top of thick red lines that you can see scattered around, and those are the VTrans high crash locations. And so what we're seeing by the crashes, there are a number of these clusters that aren't necessarily statewide high crash locations, so we might want to be looking a little bit more closely. And really the whole Route 7 corridor is a fairly high crash rates, and then there's a little spot in Middlebury on 116 that looks like a hot spot too, so we're going to be looking at you know, what does this data tell us in a little more detail as we get in, but again, your observations or thoughts on this are most definitely welcome. And then another issue that we've heard about and again talk about tonight is the impact of agricultural vehicles on the road network and on the transportation system in general, and there's clearly, these are just little symbols where are there are farms, there's a lot of farms in Addison County. And as we looked at the agricultural census data that most recently available, it's interesting that the number of farms, so the blue lines are from 2007 and the red from 2012. That was the only data they had available, but there's been a growth in the number of farms, which anecdotally you'd hear more about, well, farms are consolidating, so there could be fewer farms, but we're actually seeing growth in both the number and also the chart on the right shows acreage of farms, um, market value of farm products in the middle, and then average income per farm on the right. And those are all going up quite a bit for a five-year period. So it's definitely showing a lot of change and growth in the agricultural economy based on that. And maybe you're, whether you're seeing it on the ground or if you're feeling the impact on the ground is um, certainly possible. But interesting that both you know areas and numbers are growing across the county. Another issue that we had heard a concern about is truck traffic. Um, Vermont has a designated truck network of the main roads where they really will try to make sure are designed safely for trucks and you know designed to serve the demand. And it's really Route 22A and Route 7 are on that network. And the east-west corridors are not, not that there aren't trucks on them, but they're not in that priority network. And we did look at the heavy truck traffic, what I have in medium truck traffic on the next slide, <coughs> and we don't have as long of a time horizon for the status, so that's 2000 on the left and up to 2015 on the right. And then we don't have as many data points where they collect truck data, so that's why we don't have quite so many lines. But the uh, line on the very top there, that's kind of the dark orange is for Jen's Route 22A, so that's the road with by far the most truck traffic, and it's up in the 400s per day. And it's, you know, like a lot of the data 
shows it bouncing around, so it's hard to know if it's back on an upward trend or what's going on. Um, the Route 7 stations for are kind of in the middle there, one in Middlebury, one in New Haven. They're both showing a little bit of an uptick of a trend. And then the other routes have definitely lower volumes and not necessarily clear, certainly not necessarily a clear growth trend and maybe bouncing around. Now these are heavy trucks, which are tractor trailers. And then this next slide is medium truck traffic. This is more dump trucks, single unit trucks, delivery trucks. So not ones with the big impact. And again, here Middlebury's kind of growing up quite a bit as well as um, Route 7 in New Haven and Virgin's just a dark line. So we're really seeing a lot of growth in this category of trucks more than the large ones. And then the other thing that we're seeing, the conflicts with trucks and our village centers, and I just, um, it, the map's a little hard to read, but we have official visit village centers in Virgins and Middlebury and Bristol, and they're shown in the actual border, so they're small. And then the other orangey dots are places that are identified by the state or the region as, you know, potential, a village center that exists but not officially designated. So a place where there's more and commerce or development and a little hub of activity of some sort. So, And these are really the places that are feeling the pinch of more and more truck traffic, particularly in Virgins where they've been a great downtown revitalization at the same time truck traffic is growing. Can, can I jump in just real sure. quickly? Um, they're actually, they're not necessarily village centers. Some of them are actually designated downtowns, Virgins. And oh, right. Virginia. I'm sorry. I should have said downtowns. Right, right. Yeah, I think the yellow ones are downtown, so the label's not correct. But. So the other part of the transportation network is looking at the non-highway modes. Um, there's a really a pretty good public transit system in the region, and I'll get another slide with a little more detail. There's a network of park and ride lots, which are some used more than others, but we'll be looking at, you know, where are they overflowing? Where might there be good places for additional ones? Um, airports and ferries and uh, railroad, of course. So, and one of the things we've seen a big uptick on, you know, given that the region as a whole, remember the traffic isn't growing, but this is the ridership and ACTR. Sorry, the title's a little bit cut off. In the last 12 years, it's jumped up more than doubled in how many rides they're giving per year. And then the route map on the right shows that you can get up to Burlington and all the way down to Rutland. Their route system has been expanding and people are really responding by riding it and, and using it more and more to get around. So it's certainly something that is on a growth trend and um, potentially in carrying that on in the coming years. And, you know, again, what we're not doing the transit plan, but we're, you know, kind of doing the regional plan that would support their services. So it's certainly important to consider. And we don't have a ton of data on bicycling, just because it's not collected when they do traffic counts. Although in a few places we have spots of data here and there. But the Agency of Transportation has done a bicycle use study on state highways. And they've come up with a map. This is a piece of a statewide map. And I think some of you may have seen this already. But this is their map that they put out to designate which of the state highways are the highest priority for bicycle use and therefore improvements to serve bicycles. And those are in the blue. And then the green is moderate and the yellow is low priority. And what I heard from Josh is that the people who have seen this don't necessarily agree <laughs> with the, the characterization. So um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of data to really counter it, but certainly whatever we can pull together with anecdotes or other evidence that, you know, which routes are important to well, get shoulders. I think we, we touched on a little bit, but I think we, you know, we, this is an opportunity to use the plan to distinguish within the region you know, our Addison County region version of this map because no one likes them. So, you know, Ferrisburg. Oh, today. Maybe I'm just driving <laughs> it the wrong. I mean, <laughs> I've been driving that commute a year and a half I'm and sure. I've probably seen fewer than 10 bicycle commuters. So anyways, it's, 
it, you know. So anyway, a topic definitely to be thinking about and really relying more on local observations. And you know, as we get into the discussion, one of the things to think about, you know, if you don't necessarily ride a bike, but if you drive and there are parts on the road that you feel like <coughs> it's not good, you'd see bicyclists and it's not a good situation sharing because you're kind of put into danger trying to pass them or that kind of thing. Those are places where maybe the road network isn't serving the mix of use as well. So definitely keep that in mind as we get into the next step of trying to map out some of the hot spots. So now I want to jump ahead a little bit onto what are some of the trends that we need to be thinking of. You know, and that this plan will go, you know, 20 years out is kind of the general horizon. And there's potentially a lot of changes in the horizon. And, you know, just one example is Uber is coming to Vermont. It's not in Middlebury yet or in <laughs> Jens, but it's definitely a potential new way of getting around that people can rely on that rather than owning a car. And we're seeing that more and more in other parts of the country, and it's, it's getting started here. And then the other big, well, not the other, but one other big change that we can expect to see some some rumblings of or hearing and potentially things on the road are autonomous and connected vehicles. And there's just a big announcement today that the Federal Highway Administration is going to be officially supporting the development of these because it had been mostly an initiative of car manufacturers and Google and other technology companies. And the FHWA is on board with their main <coughs> conclusion is that autonomous cars will really increase safety on the roads. So, um, and then this is just a quote from one of the trans federal transportation officials. We envision in the future you can take your hands off the wheel and your commute becomes restful or productive instead of frustrating and exhausting. And just to offer a little bit of um, the range of technologies, an autonomous car would be one that can ultimately drive itself. There's different levels of it, and the many cars on the road now have some of the early features of autonomous operation, which would be seeing a car slow down, sensing a car slowing down ahead of them and putting on the brakes and that kind of thing. So, and correcting when they see, when the car detects that you're crossing the white line on the edge, it'll rumble and wake you up and get you back on the road. There's, there's a lot of things like that. And, they're going to be all layered and layered on until they get to the point where cars can actually drive themselves. And then connected vehicles are where potentially you can be on a road and your car is sensing the vehicles on either side so they can drive along much closer space than they can now, which means you know, more efficiency. You know, we're not dealing with a lot of congestion here in Addison County most likely, so it may not be the biggest change. But on interstate highways, for instance, you'll have platoons of cars really closely spaced instead of scattered or weaving or passing like they are now. So those are both you know, related technologies that sort of come together. And then we're already seeing in Pittsburgh, there's Uber using autonomous cars as what they're seeing as the future way that they'll be able to offer rides without the driver, but with the cars that can drive themselves. And these are being piloted in Pittsburgh. And one of the things I've been learning about on autonomous vehicles is you know, you think of the Google cars in California where they have nice weather and clean pavement and white lines and the roads are well maintained so the cars can read the white lines and get around and, you know, there are real challenges with dirt roads and snowy weather and other things. So it's, it's very likely Vermont will really lag behind adopting this technology as compared to other parts of the country and that probably has a lot of big implications for the economy and, and a lot of things, so we'll have to be, can't figure that out now, but <laughs> as we go forward, important to think about. And then this is a chart that we, um, I found on a report on autonomous vehicles, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, it's just kind of interesting, and the, the chart here shows all different kinds of technologies that are coming, and it's called the hype cycle, where when you reach a point where everyone's talking about something and everyone has huge expectations and the feeling is autonomous vehicles are kind of at that peak right now. And then as we learn more about the realities of autonomous vehicles, the 
hike will fall off and then eventually it'll level out to a more plateau where we'll figure out the right role of them in our transportation system and it may not be what we expect it to be now. So, so these are all also things to keep in mind that what we're hearing about the future of autonomous vehicles may or may not be where we really end up, especially in Vermont with our climate and our dirt roads and you know, rural environment. So another thing to be thinking about, and as we look ahead, the population of Addison County along with all of Vermont is aging. And this is just a chart that shows how much people drive per day on average through the course of their life from age 17 to 90, and you know, it really falls off. So the, what we're seeing on a lot of the corridors of flat traffic is not surprising given you know, the communities might even be seeing some growth, but it's sort of offset by the aging of the population that's likely to continue everywhere except maybe Chittenden County in Vermont. And, you know, obviously that could change too, but. And then another type of change we might be seeing in the future is about car ownership. There's a lot of changes in what we call the sharing economy where people Younger people especially are much more willing to think about sharing things and that's kind of what Uber represents where you don't own a car and you're sharing it with all the other people that ride that Uber car. But in rural areas it might be more likely that using social media and other connections will be easier to share a car or a truck or you know use a vehicle a couple of days a week while somebody else uses it or hook on rides together because you can connect more easily. So. We might see a lot different levels of car <coughs> ownership, even though it's, we're in a fairly rural area. So, so now we want to kind of open up for some discussion and get your thoughts and ideas. And I have <coughs> a couple things to um, prompt some discussion in some of the conversations and input from. We have a wiki map, which I'll tell you more about if you don't know. We've gotten a few issues. It's just a a subsample of what we've been hearing about, but that we've heard so far. And the first one on the list is the truck traffic in Virgins it has been becoming a real conflict between the vision of the downtown and the revitalization and people out in the streets more, and then the growing freight traffic in the corridor. We've also heard a lot about the impact of large or seemingly getting larger agriculture vehicles on the roads with the farming economy growing, that's not surprising. And then also the impact of farms on the roadside water quality as Vermont's stormwater regulations are getting more stringent and more um, efforts to clean up Lake Champlain. Um, towns are becoming more responsible for the runoff from their roadside ditches, much of which is coming from farms. So there's kind of a regulatory and you know, maintenance concern. Um, We'd certainly want to hear about safety, congestion, or infrastructure issues, the places where the infrastructure doesn't seem to be working as well as you would like to. And we have, today, tonight we have a paper map. We'd love to get your notes on it. And we also have a wiki map, which is an online tool. And we have some postcards that show the address. Please take one with you at home if you want to leave early and rather do some online or bring some to other meetings and share the, share spread the word around so we can get more input on that. And then really anything else you want to talk about. So so I, just to prompt discussion, and we can turn back on the lights and kind of sit around and talk. You know, what are your top concerns related to transportation in the region? And then how can the region be prepared for future with autonomous cars, shared vehicles, or some of the other trends we're seeing, and also the aging population that we'll have more and more trouble maybe meeting their transportation by driving. And then getting into the map of what are the hot spots that you see in the region, you know, where are things falling short or seem unsafe, may or maybe or maybe not showing up in the crash data and that kind of thing. So should we get the lights back on and since we have a nice small group we can just have a, a round table and um, I think we'll just take notes. I have a flip chart, but maybe just hear your thoughts, concerns. I'll start. I'll okay. start at the top of the list. Great. Uh, I, as a, uh, I, I live in Virgins. Uh, I'm the chair of the planning commission in Virgins. And 
I have one of the wiki comments on, on the map already. Um, but essentially, you hit it that you know, there's increased tra traffic on 22A. Um, we are a designated downtown. 22A is also our main street. And there are lots of trucks that go through depending on the time of day. Uh, we recently went through a process uh, for the Strong Connections, excuse me, Strong Communities Better Connections grant program, and we are working very hard at trying to incorporate some of those things in our plan and to make our downtown more pedestrian and bike friendly. I noted on your map that you also had us as a high priority bike corridor. Um, and, and so, in the, in the current transportation plan, you know, it talks about improving north south mobility. We agree that's an important goal. I mean, there, that, that functionality needs to continue for the economic vitality of the area. But we also have this other goal that's seemingly at odds with it, you know, in, in, in the designated downtown. And there are times where it's relatively unsafe. Um, I'm not a bicyclist, but if I were, crossing the Otter Creek Bridge would scare me to death. Um, I've had a lot of people say that it does. Is that on Route 22A? Uh, on 22A, uh, going over Otter Creek. It's, um, you know, it's been around for a while, but it's not really wide enough. There's a, there's a sidewalk on one side of it, but not on the other side. Um, when the trucks are trying to go up the hill, and picking up some speed to get up the hill, especially in wintertime, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a frustrating problem because there's no easy answer. And we just want the plan to acknowledge that and maybe help us figure out what we can do and, and how to reconcile those two. And did the Strong Communities Program not necessarily we deal with that we, head on? Or well, we talked about some traffic calming things, and, and those are some things that we are trying to pursue. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we if we put in raised crosswalks everywhere and and uh, roundabouts at the ends of town, well, what will that do to the trucks? What will happen? Where where will that create a problem elsewhere. So, you know, we're just trying to figure out what's what's the best way to deal with all of that. Yeah, and that's a tough yeah. one, but <laughs> certainly Absolutely. this is the time to, you know, to reach an exactly. issue. Exactly. So. so, you know, I'm not looking for any solutions or answers right now. It's a process. Um, you know, I know earlier our mayor floated a bypass proposal that, you know, landed with a big thud, um, I think it's more, you know, we want to have that dialogue. We want to be able to at least have everybody acknowledge that, yeah, there is a problem here. Let's work together to figure a way out of it. Is, has VTRAN shown any interest in a bypass? Um, yes and no. Uh, there, was, there was a study that was done, oh boy, late 90s. And then it, it pretty much got abandoned. And actually, when we were um, making the final presentation uh, to VTrans and ACCD uh, at the end of July for the uh, SCBC program, um, you know, I brought that point up as far as you know, we've got this these competing things, and uh, the, the the Secretary of Transportation was in the room at the time, and he said, "Well, you know." Yeah, that's not out of the question, but you've got to have buy-in from area communities as well. It's got to, you know, it's got to go through the process. I was just thinking of that new bypass in Morrisville. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know which solved a lot of problems in downtown Morrisville. Absolutely. So. I believe, I'm not exactly sure where in here, uh, well, look at that. That's right to the, the exact page. Um, so the current plan, 2008, uh, on page 620, <clears throat> under roadway recommendations, uh, recommends update alternative analysis for 
Vermont 22 Pi pass even for gens. Yep. So I think that's something that definitely needs so to be probably still carried over and, through, yeah. you know, I think further emphasized, you know, to identify funding to, to have that completed. Um, I think that's a, you know, this is one of the, the biggest issues in the region yeah. currently. I've, I've only, you know, been in my role for a year and a half, but along with well, the Little Rail Bridges, and that seems to be... Looking at the, the data that you presented tonight, you, you know, it's, it's clear. It's pretty you compelling, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. one, just one of the ideas that was floated at one of the tech meetings was 22A being southbound through Virginia, yeah. Yeah. and then northbound coming over 17 from 22A back out to 7, but that's a complete change and upgrade of infrastructure on... Mm -hmm on 17 to support it and the intersection at 17 and 7 is not conducive to right. heavy truck traffic. So. And, and that, that was that was part of the proposal that, that Bill Benton, uh, Mayor of Virginia, has put forth and kind of, um, you know, New Haven, Addison, a lot of the, the surrounding towns just to be able to say, no way. <laughs> um, you know, whether that's the solution or there's another one, I don't know, but we're just looking to have that conversation and get, get some people thinking about good ways to make it make it work. Well, it's always important to look at alternatives. Yeah, so absolutely, that be one that's uh, relatively that's easy to, compared to creating something brand new. Yeah. yeah. So it'd be good to know what we can try to do a little sleuth thing to see why did the other one not. Yeah. And a lot of these projects didn't advance because of money or maybe environmental permits yeah. or. I'm and not sure. I've never, I've not been able to get my hands on the actual. I know. Um, I'll study from the the trans library or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I have observed that I think the study that was done whenever back in the 90s may have assumed that you needed a highway bypass. Right. And do we really need a highway bypass or do we need like a truck route? More of it's a not a, it's and that might be a lot lower cost. I mean, that's a, something that I think there's maybe some options that they didn't mm -hmm. look at because they were assuming it had to be high speed and then you know way around town. That that was part of it at the time. You know, they were talking about a bridge over Otter Creek, this, uh, you know, downstream, and you know, going through Panton and, and all of that. And I think it was uh, cost was a, was the, the deal breaker on that one. Right. But, right. So if there's a, a, a by better changing way the to, expectations, maybe there's right. that the cost would be still be expensive, no doubt. But exactly. And look, he's got it right uh, there. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the only known copy. <laughs> okay. Well, it's precious. So, so we better scan it. I'm going to take a quick peek. Thank you. All right. So, what else do people have? Yep. So uh, one of my top concerns is shifting the uh, overall uh, transportation planning discussion away from just uh, primarily highway with everything else as an augment to more how do people move around the how can people move around the region outside of cars as we see with uh, lowering driving numbers and increased use of public transportation for a whole host of reasons. Uh, this comes touches many things like the uh, actor in um, Chittenden County CTA uh, in terms of bus routes, but also the the uh, rail passenger rail and commuter rail, and uh, so one of the challenges there are a couple big challenges with that. One of which is that. Uh, are, we have very limited options in ter terms of t hours of operation and timing of the ACTR and CCTA buses. Uh, the commuter bus, the last northbound commuter bus uh, during weekdays leaves at 7.15 from Merchants Row. Uh, so if you miss that bus, you're not taking the bus to Burlington. And similarly, the last southbound bus to Middlebury from Burlington leaves Burlington at 5.30. So um, similarly, somebody has works a later schedule, say 10 to 6, there's no way they can use public transportation. So whether that comes through passenger rail 
that is shorter trip times or increased hours of bus uh, options, there's a real opportunity for growth, especially getting into the idea of evening service uh, for buses uh, later in the evening. So people who either work late or stay in Burlington for uh, after normal office hours, dinner, cultural activities, getting back. Uh, the limited timing means that the buses are only available to people who can meet that tight schedule, which really limits their potential. Similarly, once we get to our village centers, whether it's for Jens, Middlebury, um, Bristol, and others, when folks are using public transportation, getting that last mile or even half a mile becomes problematic when we don't have uh, walkable and bikeable communities. And so ensuring that we have connections from the uh, public transportation station, <coughs> public transportation stops out to the rest of the communities that jive with those hours of operation is important. I believe in for Jen's this, the link stop is at the park and ride, right. which is outside of the village downtown. So now people have to drive from the downtown of one of the sidewalk projects that's going on is extending our our sidewalks. We're getting closer. We still aren't quite mm -hmm. there yet, but we're working. So on that. just getting to mm -hmm. the transit transit Absolutely. stops is a problem. So really looking at the region holistically and how do we allow people to get from say Burlington and other major population centers to our downtowns and then all the way to their destination without needing a car f to fill in the gaps. I'm from Actor. We're always looking to expand service. Mm -hmm. We are expanding some service where we can. The data doesn't support what you're asking for at this at this point. Um, you, know, yeah. you can't run empty buses. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to go to our website and let us know that they would like that service. We're in uh, October. We're going to be closing the gap to for Jens in Bristol, so there's only going to be an hour midday gap. Um, we're looking at midday to Burlington, mm -hmm. um, maybe as early as springtime. So we're looking out on the horizon. It's um, it's it's a culture change for mm -hmm. folks in a rural area. Public transportation just takes longer to get to your destination than hopping in your mm -hmm. car, and that's that's a hard. Um, change for a lot of people. Um, if we had ridership and we could go to VTrans with that ridership, we're looking to expand. It, now, uh, uh, with Actor, has there been an, a, any attempt to pilot, uh, say, later evening buses on the link route to Burlington? We're always looking for pilots, but we'd have to go. There's no money for expansion right now, so we'd have to go with a compelling case to each one. That's uh, we've had to we've had to realign some other uh, uh, routes that uh, just uh, you know everybody said, well, we really want it and we're going to ride it, and nobody rode it, so we've had to pull that service back to justify uh, building service to the tri uh, to for Jens in Bristol mm -hmm. during midday. So right now, there's no, I mean, that, there is money for expansion, but you've got to be creative. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy sell right now. So, you know, as people tell us that, geez, I'd really like to be able to uh, come back from Burlington later, and we could, 116 has been very successful. That commuter route, but it, it doesn't go as late. Mm -hmm. Maybe as some small population of people would like it to. Yeah, I, my partner, uh, rides the link bus to Burlington from Middlebury uh, two or three days a week and um, but often a tent getting to Burlington by 10 a.m. rather than 9 a.m. on the 715 mm -hmm. bus um, and then leaving later in the evening uh, would work better for her so that's been a case where numerous days she's driven to Burlington because the schedule didn't align with the bus mm -hmm. and it was yeah, just GM, too early. GMTA makes those decisions right now. Um, we're always looking to expand. Mm -hmm. we're, 
we're looking out into the out years and, and have identified some areas where we think we can expand. It's uh, getting the money and then starting the pilot project. Mm -hmm. And then having the people support. Um, a lot of energy committees have come to us and said, we would love to have service from our town. And, mm -hmm. um, when we start to look and identify how much, who would ride, it's, it's just not enough to uh, reduce the carbon footprint enough to have those buses just circling mm -hmm. without ridership. But yeah. encourage people to let us know what they yeah. uh, go to our website and just please let us know. That's mm -hmm. part of the way we can start to gather the data. Right. One thing we might be able to put as a prompt for this wiki map we're doing is where would you take a bus from or where, yeah. you know, there's probably some other online tools. So, I mean, I've read some, you know, theorizing, which maybe it's not in reality yet, but that social media and communication can help bring people together that might want to use transit to, you know, maybe start some small routes. Mm -hmm. I know you guys are pretty successful at finding <laughs> ways to serve, but mm -hmm. maybe there's some. I will make one other comment. You talked about an aging population and um, the number of people driving going down. Your data went to 2009. We're finding just the opposite. Um, a lot of our meal programs that were very successful in the past uh, have just dropped right off. Um, we only have one uh, meal program in Bridgens that we're currently servicing. We used to have one in Middlebury that was uh, used a lot. So we're reaching out and trying to identify who might use it. But the age 60 is now the age 70. So people are, in our estimation, and what we've seen, are driving later into life. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, on average, an individual will drive less, but maybe there is a change. In or um, the baby boomers aging are still driving more, or still working more, too. And we're also finding that uh, friends are driving friends. So um, somebody in their late, late 60s are driving two or three friends instead of hopping on instead our... Instead of using the bus. Oh. Yeah, instead of our meal service, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Until the weather gets <laughs> nasty. Do you have in your mind or at the agency an idea of what would be your next routes or what would be the next things you add to mid, if you had money, if someone gave you mid midday to Burlington, which would coincide with the medical center. Um, right now, uh, take a bus to Burlington. You've got to wait till late afternoon to come back. And that's just not convenient so for somebody an appointment who, to, right, to be appointments, there. shopping, uh, you, you know, you have to go up early in the morning, you can't come back until the commuter runs come back. So that midday service would bridge the gap and hopefully grow. And that would be a logical um, expansion route because of so many services in Wellington. Right. I'm trying to think back to your, your earlier data here. Do we, do we know the, the number of, um, the, the actual number of people who are commuting from uh, Aston County up to the greater Burlington area? We do. I can't tell you yeah, <laughs> right now, but we have the data, you know, so that might be. And we can do a little bit of analysis of town to town and how that's changed as well. But yeah. do you have a sense of changes in well, I know I'm listening, I'm listening to what Bill's saying about. Down here? Well, I'm just thinking about what Bill's saying about Actor, and, and also thinking about the improvements of the Western Mail Corridor, Amtrak service coming in, in you know a few years, and the viability of a commuter rail line that would run and take people from Middlebury and Ferrisburg up to Burlington and back on a regular schedule. I don't know what the demand would be for that if you're not seeing the demand to run more frequently up Route Seven with the buses. Well, Route Seven is congested. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, anybody that drives it knows it is. Hopefully, that will drive more people on expanded commuter runs. Mm -hmm. um, if Amtrak comes in, um, I would think they're going to, similar to the other service in the state, they're going to come in once in the morning and then once back through. Yeah, that's all that would be. So that and that would be too expensive, I would think, for for regular commuting. But I'm just wondering about the opportunity for a commuter rail line, which I guess we've had in the past. Right, they ran up to Burlington. There was one for a while, right, that ran yeah, while well, the Shelburne Road construction. 
I don't know if it came all the way down to Middlebury, though. No, it was Charlotte. Yeah. Charlotte. Was it Charlotte? Was still here this. <coughs> so I don't know if those train cars are sitting there somewhere because <laughs> I think it actually ran for a while. So. Yeah. I know a lot of people who work in Burlington and have to make that drive every day. So um, you know because other their schedules and uh, you know one one answer is to have a commuter rail line that runs up. And uh, you know, in, in, you know, on a regular schedule, it goes up there and back. But I don't know what the economics of that might be. Well, we've seen ridership drop off as the price of gas has gone down. Yeah, right, right. So we were better. Our ridership has flattened out on some of those routes, commuter routes, which you know doesn't bode well for expansion. But it's it it is a congested route. I mean, there's a combination of factors that would have people seeking alternative means to getting to Burlington, which could drive a better schedule. I can't <clears throat> help but wonder, as someone that does the reverse, I live in Burlington, an option that just from there to here, you know, that just maybe, maybe one stop in between. You know, one of the major reasons that I don't take public transit is laying on the ground over there. I can't, you know, afford the extra time away during the day um, when I need to get back. Right. So that, you know, taking the, the, the transit options to and from Burlington is just, just too much time for me. It does take long. So I, you know, I can't help but wonder, there, there are a significant, you know, Adam and, and Kevin who work here live in, South Burlington and Shelburne, and, and that I mean, there's I'd be like a significant amount of, of people that, that live up in Trenton County and head south. There was a, just a more efficient, you know, direct well, there to here. Yeah, I think there will be. But, you know, as you're planning for the future, <coughs> you're looking to the future as well. And we just have to. It's kind of like a chicken, you know, you need the, the data to support the expanded service, but you know, we can with the expanded service, yeah, you know. We can always run pilot projects as, as, as we can justify. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there will be more options in the future. Just, um, you know, how much, how much more traffic can the seven support? And at what point do people say, I'd rather let somebody else drive? And it's worth the extra time. Entering. Yeah. <laughs> She's seen you, 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 you stuck in traffic on Route 7, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's concurring. <laughs> Denali. Denali. So, in addition to the uh, public transit options between the population centers, um, one other uh, area of concern for me uh, as a bicycle commuter in Middlebury, um, but also somebody who uses a bicycle to get around between our towns, is the connection between our towns. So specifically, uh, River Road in Bristol is a major um, bicycle access between Middlebury and Bristol, which uh, has its challenges with uh, no shoulder. It's a narrow country road, uh, poor visibility in areas. Um, similarly, just getting to River Road um, involves going out Exchange Street in Middlebury uh, is one of the primary access ways, which the town is a grant out to potentially get a shared use path to connect um, through there, but as we look at uh, how one can survive without a car, there are a lot of gaps. And uh, just in Weybridge, uh, heading to Weybridge yesterday, uh, over the past weekend, and saw many people cycling on Route 23, the Weybridge Road, which is also windy, very poor visibility, high traffic speeds, and so looking at how we can connect our town centers and allow people to not be terrified um, then opens up other options for people getting out of cars and make, doing that two-mile trip from the outside of town into the shops and vice versa or between towns. Well, getting your input on 
at least what you see, mm -hmm. and hopefully from other people as well, where is the lowest hanging fruit? Because yeah, so I just saw a plan. I think it was in the Independent about a uh, Route 125 west of the college, <coughs> out to Cider Mill Road, possibility of a shared use path to get out to Cider Mill. One of the the town of Middlebury was considering a transportation alternatives planning grant is that, application for that. Okay. I don't know if that's what you're Okay, about. maybe that's what it was, yes. So a planning grant for something like that, yeah. which that's one of those where uh, <coughs> there's a sort of cluster of housing in Cornwall just outside of Middlebury, and it's not re reasonable to use that as to get into downtown Middlebury from those areas uh, it's also used heavily by runners and others, but it's very unsafe section of road with uh, very little visibility due to hills. There was one road I think I remember hearing about where they added the shoulders just for biking somewhere in the Middlebury area, I thought. Is that ring a bell? I guess not. Uh, Possibly Route 30 in Cornwall during the last oh, week, maybe? That. Yeah, Route 30. Um, I'm not sure about that. And do you but, generally think the way to go is separate paths versus shoulders? or? I think it's a combination of them. Um, the key is linking, in my mind, is linking where people are trying to go. Um, and this was some of the, uh, was captured in that state uh, on-road bicycling plan. Um, without gaps. And so I live in the village, east side of the Middlebury village and work right in the center of the village. And part of my commute, just for two <coughs> blocks, it falls being on Cork Street. And that two blocks <coughs> is the far and away the worst part of the commute that <coughs> I need to make a left turn, get out into traffic and make left turns. There's no bike lane on Cork Street. It's very heavy traffic at the commuting times of the day. Uh, <coughs> I specifically moved from the south side of town because I had been commuting for about uh, all the way on Cork Street uh, out to Halliday Road, and that was uh, terrifying through several of the sections past the high school. And so that's a town highway rather than the state, and uh, it has rates that are an inch below the pavement surface so you can't even use the tiny bit of shoulder that is there um, but that whole um, that section of road like many of other many others means that people who would need to traverse that area will end up driving as uh, most of my neighbors did because uh, it was just there are points that are too scary and people who are not uh, very confident cyclists with a willingness to take risks in traffic just won't do. So we need to connect those and allow people to get where they need to go. So I think, you know, one thing we probably won't be able to identify those all in here, but maybe identify examples of them. And mm -hmm. a lot of this will have to be done at somewhat of a more local level, although I know the region's kind of been looking more at bike, bicycle planning. Is that right, Josh? You guys have a bike yes. plan yeah. committee, and so and you're on it. He's okay, <laughs> so, the core of that. Um, but yeah, the importance of becoming a system, and you know, mm -hmm. it's not going to you're not going to bicycle across the region, but you can certainly get more in those hot spots where there is traffic congestion and accidents and other things happening, so. And you have to address, I think, the recreational bikers in the hall. And, uh, in probably two different ways, too. In two Maybe different we ways. Really talk uh, about the different types. I, I have to reflect uh, on what uh, Josh said before with the state plan and the, <coughs> and the money they're putting into Route 7, and you don't see the bikers out there in Route 7 to me, justifying the expense of what they're doing out there through some of the towns. But you look at some of the rural routes in the smaller communities, and you look at, at least for three seasons, all the recreational bikers that you have going around on roads with 
absolutely no shoulders. Good. Uh, poorly maintained gravel roads. You know, they're out there for the scenic, you know, beauty of this state, and especially in the town where I live, in Salisbury, around uh, Lake Dunmore, there's nowhere to put any shoulders. So you have to look at a way, uh, how do you keep it in the motorist's mind that it's shared road with both pedestrians and bikers? And I, I think that's uh, extremely important because uh, just last July we had somebody hit mm -hmm. at, on the road at an intersection in Salisbury. A biker went right up into the windshield. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's important for the rural communities in, in the county. It would help to identify alternative routes. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you can't everywhere, but using Route 7 South as an example, Mm -hmm. uh, turning right, going out through Buttoff Acres, um, mm -hmm. putting up signs directing or designating ways around as a bike route. I mean, on a bike it might take a little bit longer, but not a lot longer. There are some of those. However, uh, one of the challenges when we start looking at bypasses is that, uh, especially when one is pedaling, the extra effort adds up pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and so um, yes, there are there are some of those. But uh, the way, especially Butt Off Acres, has been designed as this sort of insular place that connects out to the feeder roads mm -hmm. uh, makes it very difficult to use alternative routes because the, your only access is from Monroe Street, or uh, the previous one would be. Uh, through a gravel path uh, by the hockey rink um, to get into Baldolf Acres uh, and then Washington Street. So it's it's quite limited as to where you can get into it and then uh, getting back out onto Route 7 by Rogers Road is uh, almost impossible to make a left turn uh, with especially in, uh, Traffic, so there. But it, it would have to be some give and take using mm -hmm. crosswalks, and I mean, so certainly something could be, be designed. Safer. Yeah. Um, and then also with the new development south of Middlebury in the South Ridge area, Fields Road, um, off of Middle Road, uh, getting into town from there become is similarly problematic. You come out of Middle Road at the top of the hill, and then. It's a very constricted uh, bit of Court Street down to the Monroe Street intersection. And so getting into downtown from those neighborhoods becomes very difficult. Uh, or using the, the, the TAM trail, could that be? For some people sometimes in parts of the year. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, my goal is that I would like to see people who are, you know, age six bicycling, age 76, people of all ages able to be feel comfortable getting themselves uh, under their own power rather than feeling like it's too scary. And we have a long way to go in terms of infrastructure in Middlebury, but also in the county as a whole. Great. There's certainly a lot of opportunity. I did notice, you're from For Chance, I don't know if anyone else is, but there was no representative biking in Virgins. You had a fair amount in Middlebury. <laughs> Virgins seems, yeah, you know, not as large as Middlebury, there, but there's not a so lot much of, smaller. There's a lot of through biking. Right, sure. But yeah, um, this is more residents that commute to work by bike, which yeah. maybe most people just work far away and there's a different I work at home, so. commuting <laughs> pattern. <laughs> so, <laughs> can do your stationary bike. That's right. So, great. Any other thoughts on? concerns or looking ahead to the future that you think we should be doing? Um, going to the kind of water quality when we you know discuss this in, in our steering committee meetings, but <clears throat> we really need to emphasize to the, all the towns to begin preparing for the municipal roads general permit program. They have right. to begin budgeting for the the fee and then also budgeting for for the implementation of these projects 
that they're going to be re required to start you know these road segments that or culverts or what it, whatever it may be you know they're going to be required uh, under state law to begin remediating these you know problem areas and you know the more prepared they are the, the better off they'll be right. so I think you know emphasizing that that's going to be a top concern um, you know all the way through 2030 is kind of the first they're going to have to have their initial assessment, you know, inventory assessment, and prioritization, and then they have, are going to be required to have a percentage of those projects finished by 2030. So, you know, emphasizing that and, you know, maybe covering ways, you know, to suggestions on how to help them prepare, perhaps. Right. The capital sure. budgeting and yeah, uh, you know, utilizing investments the existing, going to be needed. Yeah. Utilizing these existing programs and grant pro, you know, grant funding to get themselves ready. Another, I think, important issue, and I think we're we're going to be losing something shortly. That the uh, training of our road foremen, at least them getting together to discuss problem, uh, problems and programs, would still leave in Cornwall. He was doing a pretty good job of it mm -hmm. uh, in the county of bringing all the road funding together. So it may be something that regional planning is going to have to shepherd to get an ongoing relationship with the road foreman, at least to create the dialogue, get them talking, and then keep them trained up for any changes. Yep. <coughs> that should be part of the transplant, I would think. And that could be a big part of the environmental. Yep. And happens more locally. Yeah, I have been going to their, you know, they have their monthly meetings September through April. Um, and I usually attend uh, most of them. Yeah, but we're, we're still actually, leaving. I don't, I don't well, know. Well, actually, that's so the, the first meeting of, of, you know, the off season is on Monday. So I think that's when we're going to have the, the transition conversation and hopefully they'll be, you know, gain some clarity into that. I'm expecting and planning on playing a, you know, a larger role in facilitating that. I think it is important to, you know. Yeah, them, to, certainly. Yeah. You know, you need organization and training. Encourage and, towns yeah. to support their road foreman and, um, you know, the regional policy have the commission, you know, continually supporting and training them as needed. Uh, anything else? We can, uh, at this point, we can bring out a map, and maybe I'll put it up here in the front, and things you want to mark, whether it's bike um, shortcomings, places where you feel like the system's not working well for any reason. And, uh, and you're welcome to also take a card or take several with you to pass around and put it on the wiki map as well. So we'll bring all the input together. Welcome it all. So, and try to weave it into a coherent plan. <laughs> so, so I will get the map we have here. We got lots of pens. 